Hello, everybody. I'm Kevin, and I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic. Hey, Kevin. Yeah, welcome, everybody, to the Bill W. House here. Bill Wilson's house in East Dorset. I'd like to introduce John W. He's from Pompano Beach, Florida, uh, and he's going to help us with some of the history. Uh, let's get this thing off to a roaring start and give John a big round of applause. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, my name is John Williams, and I'm an alcoholic. How y'all doing? A lot of us from Florida here, we come along, we like out-of-town meetings once in a while, you know? <laughs> How many from Florida here? Look at that, look at that. I mean, we're, we don't, uh, and I'm surprised myself to see uh, <laughs> so many of us here. It was wonderful to see Fire and his young lady coming in this morning. Well, I want you, uh, I want to acknowledge, of course, a couple of things. I want to acknowledge uh, that we are here in a special place. And, uh, and as has been mentioned, this is a place of spirit. I don't have any doubt about that. I can just tell you what I'm experiencing, and I hope you're doing the same. And to uh, have the opportunity to be here in a sense where, uh, where some of the impressions were made on our co-founder. Carl Sandburg once said that in any society that's ever been studied, one that has come and gone, it always had one common denominator. Those that had failed, the common thread was this, that they had forgotten from whence they came. And so we in AA certainly don't want to do that. We're not the first ones to come this way. We're not the first. But those who have come and gone seem to have gotten lost and uh, got diverted from their primary purpose. And, so, and alcoholism has been with us for a long time. Alcoholism is nothing new. The treatment of alcoholism is relatively new, but alcoholism has been with us ever since we discovered how to crush in grapes and ferment them, and then take them and found out that it does some wonderful things to the head. And uh, as a matter of fact, there's a piece in the Bible that describes the alcoholic, and Joe likes to talk about that, and he probably will sometime this afternoon, in which the alcoholic is really described. And... Uh, uh, then there are hieroglyphics in Egypt that describe the alcoholic, pretty much like the one in the Bible. And uh, in this country, this country was founded on patriotism and all that good stuff, but we were heavy drinkers in the colonial days, really heavy drinkers. As a matter of fact, it was probably our biggest pastime. When you read about how our history and our Constitution was written, you wonder sometimes how they even got it done, because they partake of L to a great extent. And it was so bad in those days that one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence was a fellow by the name of Dr. Uh, Benjamin Rush. And uh, they had observed alcoholics, and, and the, the alcoholics were always observed by who? Guess who? The non-alcoholics. The non-alcoholics were always formulating opinions about us. And guess what we did? We bought into it. I know I had these same thoughts when I think about it. The, the, uh, the, uh, the people who had no problem with alcohol uh, looked at a guy and said, well, hey, must be something wrong with him. He must be weak-willed. Or some of them would look at an alcoholic and say, he must be full of sin. Or they would look and say, well, maybe this guy's just crazy. And I remember having all those thoughts when I was uh, trying to determine how I was going to straighten my life up. I had times when I thought I was weak-willed. I bought into it. I had those times when I thought, well, God was just punishing me. I, I was just too sinful. And I certainly had thoughts about being crazy. And these were thoughts formulated by the non-alcoholic about us. It's always been that way. So Dr. Benjamin Rush, in the, after the death, he was, a, he was a physician, and he wrote a paper on alcoholism. And, uh, and, uh, and in it he said that, that there were, that alcoholism was a disease, and that the only answer to alcoholism was uh, total abstinence. And, uh, but... He didn't get much publicity on that, but he was one of the first to write that. You see, Dr. Rush had part of, the, part of the, the, the thing that ultimately turned out to be the answer. He had two parts of it, but he didn't have a program of action. And the next thing to come along with this temperance movement, and let's move on to the temperance movement and see how they, uh, what, their, what their thought was. The, uh, in the 18th century, things were getting so bad that uh, uh, a lot of people began to die from alcoholism. 
and, and the do-gooders were looking around and wondering what to do with it. So they started this temperance movement, and the temperance movement was, uh, the original idea of the temperance movement was to encourage people to be temperate. You know, just don't overdo it. Drinking's all right, but hey, slow down. I mean, I heard that story. Uh, but by 1836, this idea had changed to total abstinence. And uh, this was the first attempt in this country to deal with a problem caused by alcohol, the temperance movement. Uh, the, the man who gave meaning and direction to this movement was a, a, a congregational minister by the name of Lyman Beecher. He was the founder of the movement. And the movement at one time claimed to have pledges not to drink from one-third of the population of the country as it existed at that time. The temperance movement's attitude towards the problem drink was very simple. Prevent the young people from drinking keep temperate drinkers temperate, and the drunks would soon die. <laughs> no problem here. <laughs> they believed that the adherence to this philosophy would solve the problem. The movement began to fail, however, immediately after they switched from promoting from temperance to total abstinence because there was a lot of people in this country who liked to have a little wine after a meal and they didn't want to go for that total abstinence business because that would mean they, would, uh, they could not be members. The thing that came after that was one that we're very familiar with. A lot of alcoholics are familiar with this next movement. It's called the Washingtonians. The Washingtonians was formed on April the 2nd in 1840. There were six of us, six men but six drunks, sitting around a, a table at Chase Tavern in Baltimore, Maryland. And they uh, soon realized that down the street there was going to be a temperance movement speaker. And so three or four of them decided they'd go down and hear what he had to say. They returned to the tavern deeply affected by what the speaker had to say at that meeting. The six men discussed forming their own society for non-drinkers and agreed to meet again the next day to make further plans. The following day an informal meeting occurred as the, man drank, as the men drank and strolled together. And then they weren't quite there yet. <laughs> They decided to quit drinking and to organize a total abstinence society. Membership fees were set at 25 cents, and the monthly dues were 12 and a half cents, and each man agreed to return to the next meeting with a new prospect. That's when I found out why it was that they grew so fast. It was a, it was a matter of mathematics. You couldn't go to the next meeting unless you took somebody with you. So if you had 10 tonight, you were guaranteed to have 20 next week, and then 40, and so on and so forth. But Anyway, the movement spread and at the end of one year had a thousand members. A thousand members at the end of one year. What did we have in the fall of 1937? Forty. And that's been said to be exaggerated. Uh, <laughs> it was the first successful group formed by alcoholics. And at the end of the second year, their, at their annual meeting, guess who was the guest speaker? Abraham Lincoln. At the height of its popularity, the Washingtonian movement claimed to have as many as 600,000 members in the United States. Considering the population at the time, it was a highly successful movement. It was also the Washingtonian movement that developed the idea of having speakers at their meetings. In order to have uh, something going on that would attract others, members were allowed to stand up and give testimony as to the troubles that they had experienced with alcohol. The practice was probably the origin of the speakers sharing their stories of experience, strength, and hope that we hear in Alcoholics Anonymous today. Uh, it has also been noted that while the Washingtonians did see, did see spirituality as a solution to the problem, they didn't fully understand the problem. They were unable to see alcoholism as a disease. Although the disease concept had been put forth in, uh, in 1785 by Dr. Benjamin Rush. The Washingtonian movement soon, however, uh, should, however, be credited with opening the first lodging home for the treatment of alcoholics in 1845. But the reason the Washingtonian movement failed was because they began to get involved in issues. They didn't have traditions like we have today. They began to get involved in issues of slavery, wet, dry, uh, and uh, they diverted, diverted them from their primary purpose. And they ultimately, at the end of seven years, after, seven years after they were formed, hardly anybody had ever heard of the Washingtonian movement. And they even had a, a society for the spouses. It was called the Martha Washington movement. And, uh, so, <laughs> makes sense. But uh, that was a that was a, uh, a a society that we look at in terms of our real need for traditions, and we'll take a look at that later. After that, we had the Emanuel movement. The Emanuel movement came about at the uh, turn of the century. 
Uh, they didn't understand or use the disease concept of alcoholism. It was uh, first organized. It was the first organized group to suggest that psychological factors were involved in problem drinkers, and don't we know that? Uh, the Emanuel movement was located principally in the eastern USA. Uh, the uh, movement uh, gave us our first uh, alcohol counselor, or credited with. Uh, his name was Courtney Baylor. Baylor had established an office to see clients, and he said that uh, he saw clients every night at, at $20 a pop. I mean, this is the early 1900s. And uh, he was a recovered alcoholic, but he didn't let anybody know about that. But uh, one of his uh, one of his protégés uh, was Richard Peabody, and Peabody wrote the book *The Common Sense of Drinking*, which was a book read by our co-founders and and uh, other people interested in recovery from alcoholism in the mid mid 1930s. Here's something that comes out of Dr. Uh, out of Peabody's *The Common Sense of Drinking*. This tells me that Dr. Suckworth must have read this book. Drinking is a manifestation of the wish to escape reality. The illusory charm of drink comes from the fact that the mental reaction to alcohol is extremely satisfying to certain basic psychological urges. Let any man reflect on his sensations subsequent to taking a drink, and I think he will agree that the resulting feeling consists, one, of calmness, poise, and relaxation, and two, of self-satisfaction, self-confidence, and self-importance. While the satisfaction of the demands for peace of mind and ego uh, maximization by alcohol may be legitimate for the average man who can control the use of it, Certain individuals, normal in other ways, have an abnormal reaction to drinking. An abnormal reaction to drinking. It is too fascinating to them. It poisons their nervous system. Those who react in this manner must eliminate drink from their lives or suffer various serious consequences. And as I say, it's possible that Silkworth probably saw that because in the doctor's opinion, he refers to some of the abnormal reactions. Thank you. Then after that, we have, uh, we're getting closer to the Alcoholics Anonymous. The next major movement about uh, alcoholism is the Oxford Group. And that was started by Frank Buckman in, uh, in 1918. Uh, he was the founder of the Oxford Group. He started out in Pennsylvania at a boys' school. He got a resentment over the, over the uh, Board of Trustees because they wouldn't give him enough money to take care of his kids. He left in the resentment, went over to the Mideast, had a spiritual experience, a female... Uh, uh, preacher, he heard, moved him, and uh, <laughs> and uh, in a lot of ways had a spiritual experience. <laughs> anyway, he moved, was moved to uh, to make amends and restitution to those trustees, and he felt free and at peace. Uh, he began to work with others and traveled in the Far East, and, and that was there that he met Sam Shoemaker, someone we will hear a little bit more about. Shoemaker was later to enter the Episcopal priesthood, and he traces the beginning of his ministry to the meeting with Frank Buckman. Uh, and why, how they got their name, well, while traveling on a train with a group of students from Oxford University, a conductor ordered them to identify themselves. The conductor then put a sign on the door of the compartment which said Oxford Group. So that's what they were. They were some students from Frank Buckman, and that's how they got their name. Sometimes things are rather simple, aren't they? <laughs> Uh, the Oxford Group has been compared to first century Christianity, and we'll hear that referred to. The Oxford Group meetings were known as house parties. One of the largest they had was uh, 36,000 people at the Hollywood Bowl in the 1930s. The philosophy of the Oxford Group may have been the origin of the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. The tenets of the Oxford Group were one, absolute honesty, two, absolute purity, three, absolute unselfishness, and four, absolute love. The procedure worked, the procedures worked, to share sins and temptation with another Christian whose life had been given to God and to use this sharing as a witness to others so that they might recognize and acknowledge their sins. Two, to surrender all of life, past, present, and future, into God's keeping and direction. Three, to make restitution to all who we have directly or indirectly harmed or damaged. And four, to listen to, accept, and to rely on God's, God, God's guidance and carry out in everything done and said, great or small. So these were the tenets that, uh, that uh, the Oxford groups were, were putting out at that time, and these were the things that influenced Roland Hazard, Abby Thatcher, uh, C, uh, Sebra, and, uh, and those early Oxford people that influenced Bill. 
Okay, let's take a look at uh, what happened after that. 1930, a fellow by the name of Roland Hazard, and this is a documented story, page 27 in our big book, it's, although Roland's name's not mentioned. He was a well-to-do businessman from, from this part of the world that, that had a drinking problem. Very wealthy, came from a wealthy family, and he was drunk. And so having the resources that he had, he went to Zurich, Switzerland, and, and, and was under the tut a counselor, counselor of uh, Carl Jung. Carl Jung was the world's greatest psychologist and psychiatrist at that time. And so Roland spent a year with, with Dr. Jung. And during that time, Dr. Young uncovered and revealed a lot of the psyche and a lot of the makeup of Roland's mind and, and all of those things that Roland thought triggered him into drinking. And so after a year, he thought it was safe to come back to the United States. And he came back to this country. But within a short period of time, he was as drunk as ever. So he went back. This guy had a lot of money. He went back to see Carl Young. And while he was over there, Carl Young, he said, I, I don't, you're, 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 you're a hopeless alcoholic. There's nothing that I can do for you. You're either going to have to get a bodyguard or be put under lock and key or you're going to die in a short period of time. And, and Roland said, isn't there any hope? Isn't there any possibility that, that this might not happen? And it was at this time that Dr. Young gave him the answer to his alcoholism. He called it a vital spiritual experience. He said, every now and then people have been having this thing and anyone on to describe it. He said it was a huge emotional displacement and rearrangement. Whereas we get rid of the old attitudes and beliefs and ideas that were our guiding force and we replace them with a new set. He says, I've been trying to arrange that in you, Roland, but I have not been successful. And uh, he said it sometimes happens and it's called a religious experience or spiritual experience. And Roland thought that that would be good because he said, I'm a good religious man. And Dr. Young said it doesn't necessarily mean the answer. He said, I suggest you immerse yourself in some spiritual program. And Roland Hazard then came back to this country and got immersed in the, in the Oxford group, never to drink again. Well, also at this same time, he had a friend by the name of Abby Thatcher. Abby Thatcher and Roland were old buddies raised in this area. At least they used to see each other at their summer homes in Manchester. And, uh, uh, and, uh, Abby was a, visiting his parents' old homestead in Manchester, uh, trying to get sober, and, and Abby had been locked up many times, and the law had already said, if you get into any trouble anymore, we're going to put you away. Well, the house in Manchester had just been recently painted, and uh, the pigeons were on Abby's house, and they were doing things to Abby's house that made Abby mad. <laughs> you know what pigeons do. And so Abby went in, got a shotgun, and started shooting them pigeons. <laughs> The law took a dim view of that, and they arrested him again. And so uh, while he was before the judge to be put away, uh, Roland and some of, a couple of his friends interceded and got the judge to release Abby to their custody. And it was at that time that Abby Thatcher got involved in the Oxford movement. A short time here, and then he was sent to New York City where uh, Dr. Shoemaker, uh, Sam Shoemaker, had the Calvary mission. And while in New York, Abby heard about his old high school buddy, Bill Wilson, who was having problems. He was in a downslide. His stock market mess was going to hell, and he was losing everything. And Abby says, I think I'll get in touch with him. And so Abby calls Bill. And Bill, glad to hear him. Come on over. An old drinking buddy. <laughs> and so Abby shows up to see Bill, and, uh, and Bill invites him in to have a drink, and Abby says, not drinking now, I got religion. <laughs> and then, of course, Bill says that that made the hair on the back of his neck bristle. But uh, the long and the short of it is, uh, I think he was thinking, I hope my I hope my gin lasts longer than this fanatic does. And uh, but Roland came in and told him what had going what was going on in his life. And Abby had been sober about six or seven months at that time. And Bill could not deny what he saw in front of him. He knew Abby by reputation and by experience. He knew that Abby was a drunk, and here he was sober and claimed to have been sober for a few months. So he made a deep impression on Bill, although Bill didn't get sober right away. He went down to that Calvary mission one time, uh, uh, and he met this guy, Alex, on the way down. He went drunk, and uh, while he was in there, uh, Bill uh, had a, was moved to testify and to give his testimony and to 
he was called. And so before Abby could grab him by the belt, Abby, Bill was up there and he, and he shared. And uh, the only thing about that is Bill didn't stay sober. And so uh, uh, a little bit later, he, uh, he did go into Towns Hospital in December 1934, about the third or fourth visit. And uh, it was there that Bill had his, his hot flash spiritual experience in December of 1934. And uh, he tries to get others sober by telling them about his hot flash experience, but he has no luck. But eventually he tries to reinsert himself back into business. He goes to Akron, Ohio in the, uh, in the, fall, in the spring of 1935. Ostensibly to take over a company. It looked pretty good. It was a proxy fight and he thought he had a good chance. He saw himself as being the CEO of some big rubber company. And, uh, he was gonna be back on Wall Street again. Back in the chips. Things are looking good, Lois. It all went bad and it all went sour and Bill found himself there in the Mayflower Hotel one Sunday afternoon on Mother's Day. Broke, beat and busted. And dejected. And he heard the sound of the music down at the end of the hall in the Mayflower Hotel. And he thought about it. Uh, he knew at that time he needed another drunk to talk to. And he noticed the directory there. And the, the long and the short of it is, he made some phone calls, got in touch with Walter Tunks. And Walter Tunks put him in, in touch with Henrietta Cyberling. And Henrietta Cyberling had known Dr. Bob. And Henrietta was an Oxford member. And she had been praying for guidance about Dr. Bob. Because it hadn't been too too long before this time that Dr. Bob had finally admitted he had a problem with drinking. And so they were praying for guidance. And it explains to me why Henrietta was so willing when this rumhead from New York called and said he's looking for another drunk to talk to, come on over. <laughs> we don't do that. And so that's why she invited him. When I, you know, read the complete story of why she invited him, they, they was, she just thought it was the answer from God. And ultimately it was, wasn't it? <laughs> so anyway, he goes over and uh, he and uh, Dr. Bob get together the next day. Eventually, Dr. Bob has his last drink on June the 10th, 1935. And uh, that's when we say AA was born. But I'm sure that Dr. Bob and Bill didn't get together that morning and say, Hello, co-founder, Here we, we've got something started here. <laughs> they didn't do it that way. Uh, as a matter of fact, that morning, Bill, Dr. Bob disappeared. He took a beer that morning because he had a, an operation to perform. Uh, he had just come back from Atlantic City, New Jersey, drunk. He had an operation scheduled, and uh, he had to have a beer to calm his nerves. He went in to perform the operation. Bill went over to his uh, house to wait on him, and he didn't show up. Of course, you know what I would have thought. I know what you, I mean, I'd have said, well, hmm, his nurse will probably call again. He probably went back to New Jersey. But uh, he finally showed up that night, and the way he had been that day was making amends. He had been out all up and down the streets of Akron, Ohio, uh, making amends and restitutions and, uh, and taking care of business. Well, Bill stays on out there for a little bit of time, comes back to New York, and in the fall of 1937, he's back in Akron. He went to Cleveland, and then he came to Akron to see Dr. Bob. And they're sitting on the porch at Ardmore. I can just see him sitting in the swing and uh, trying to... Uh, uh, just sort of recap what's gone on since since June of 1935. And they begin to count up and they suddenly realize that there were about 40 people sober using the method that they had, the six tenants that Abby had tell, told Bill about. And they begin to wonder. They knew that there were millions of alcoholics out there that needed help. And it had taken them two and a half to three years to sober up 40, which meant that people could get sober, but how were they going to get the word out? Well, here's what they thought about. Well, we need some missionaries. And hospitals. Hospitals don't want to have anything to do with drunks. We will build our own hospitals, and from the profits of the hospital, we will be able to afford the missionaries. And, oh, yes, by the way, we'll need some literature. We need to put our method down on paper. Why? So them drunks won't garble and twist it and get it all messed up. Well... They said, let's, build. now Bob liked the idea of the book, but he wasn't crazy about these hospitals and stuff. So he says, let's bring that before the, before the rest of the group here in Akron. And that group in Akron of 18 consisted a lot of Oxford people. Not all of them were alcoholics. And they didn't call themselves alcoholics at that time anyway. We didn't know what we were. But, uh, but that's what I call them. 
and they met at T. Henry Williams' home, another Oxford family who opened their house for Oxford meetings. There were just so many non-alcoholics who helped us out. And uh, at the, they called a meeting, and, the, and at that meeting that night, they put forth these ideas about missionaries and hospitals and, uh, and literature. And, of course, it was thumbs down. We don't need that mess. Uh, missionaries take, it takes money. I don't have any money. You got any money? Nobody had any money. And hospitals, that's a racket. Big business. And literature, after all, the twelve apostles didn't need literature. Why do we need it? That's where they were coming from. But they had a vote. And lo and behold, the majority says, well, let's go for it. The missionaries, the hospitals, the whole kit and caboodle. And I know why they did that in Akron, Ohio, because they knew Bill had to go back to New York to do it. So it was easy to let Bill go to New York, and when he got back to New York with the good news, the New York bunch was all excited about it. That was the kind of deal they liked. Big business. <laughs> so, so now uh, he gets back to New York, and then they begin to fundraise. And Bill goes out with some of his cronies, and they start knocking on the doors of New York City. Some of the wealthy folks are saying, hey, we need some money. we got a new way out. We got, we're got we sobering up alcoholics. We need some help. Here's what we want to do. We want to finance the missionaries, build a hospital, and print some literature. And those guys are saying, you got to be kidding. I think that the March of Dimes is a lot more important as far as my money is concerned. Other charities. After all, you guys bought it on yourself. Why should I give you any money? And Bill got a little upset about it. And uh, he found out that uh, that Alcoholics as a Charity wasn't going to work at all. And, but he was mad. He was really P.O.'d. So he went to his brother-in-law, Dr. Leonard Strong. And to him he delivered his message of how short-sighted the rich really were. And uh, how mad he was about it. And, uh, and Dr. Strong was a good shoulder for Bill. He always had been. And Dr. Strong says, well, listen, I know a guy with the Rockefeller Foundation... If he's alive, he'll remember me. Maybe he'll remember me. Let me put you in touch. So he called, and sure enough, Willard Richardson was still alive. And yes, in fact, he remembered Dr. Strong. And Dr. Strong told him of the success Bill was having with sobering up drunks. Would he talk to him? Willard Strong says, sure, come on over. And they did. Then they had a second meeting. And at the second meeting, it was decided that they'll have another meeting. And at this third meeting, he wants to bring in some of the Rockefeller Connection. And he wants Bill to bring Dr. Silkworth, Dr. Bob, and some of the alcoholics. And in December 1937, this meeting took place. And during this meeting, the uh, Bill and uh, the bunch began to tell their stories of what of their alcoholic misery and their recovery. And these non-alcoholics sitting around and listening and said, "Well, my God," he said, "This is first Christian, first century Christianity, just like that." And uh, what can we do to help? Well, when those magic words came out. What can we do to help? <laughs> All right. Let me tell you what you can do to help. We need money. We need missionaries. We need a hospital. We need to print some literature. And then uh, Frank Amos popped up. Uh, one of those uh, that was there at the time, he says, well, don't you think money will spoil this thing? And, of course, they said, well, we've considered that. We've already been over that argument in Akron, Ohio, haven't we? <laughs> we've considered that, but to do nothing would be just as dangerous, and they began to see that. So they formed a committee to investigate us. And Frank Amos went to Akron, Ohio, and talked to some alcoholics, found out about us, checked on Dr. Bob, found a home that could be converted into a hospital, because if they were to start a hospital, they wanted it done in Akron. Because Dr. Bob, although he'd been sober a little bit of time at this time, he had not been able to revive his practice. You see, Dr. Bob was a proctologist. And drunk or sober, not too many of us want to bend over and have this guy operate. <laughs> the gamble was not worth it. I mean, I'm, I'd have hesitated. I don't know about you. But if they were to have a hospital, he would be there to superintend it. And so... Uh, they came back. Mr. Amos made a recommendation to Mr. Richardson that uh, Mr. Rockefeller give us $50,000 to start with. With the $50,000, they could finance a couple of missionaries, put a down payment on this hospital, and uh, perhaps do some literature. Well, Mr. Willard Richardson took the report into Mr. Rockefeller and 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 uh, said, "This is Mr. Amos's report." And, and then Mr. Richardson added his own glowing reports of us and what he'd been able to determine. Mr. Rockefeller looked at it. And uh, he came up with the same thing that he'd heard before. He says, I think money will spoil this thing. And he says, I think it will will mess up the man-to-man -man approach that, still, that, that seems to be working with these guys. 
He says, I think money will spoil it. And uh, he says, I, I'm not going to give you any money. And of course, uh, when that word got back to Bill and Bob and the bunch, they, you know, they thought it was bad news. It turned out to be good news because Mr. Rockefeller right then and there was guided to save us from ourselves. I can just imagine what would have happened if he'd have said, oh, 50, why not 100? <laughs> I mean, probably by the spring of 1938, it would have been over with. <laughs> it wouldn't take us long to mess it up. But uh, he, uh, but then Mr. Richardson told him of the financial plight of Dr. Bob and Bill, and uh, and uh, Mr. Rockefeller put five thousand dollars in the Riverside Church, where Emerson Fosdick was the pastor, and uh, he said, "Let them draw on it as long as it lasts." But he says, "Don't ever ask me for any more money." Now, Mr. Rockefeller didn't give us any money, but he sure gave us some publicity. He gave us his name, and he he always loved Alcoholics Anonymous, and he later gave us a big dinner, in which he invited a billion dollars worth of uh, assets to the to a meeting in New York City. And he wasn't able to attend, but Nelson Rockefeller was there. Well, anyway, they just said, well, he's not the only guy with money in New York. We'll keep on keeping on. And it was during this time that Bill roughed out the first two chapters of the big book. His story and the chapter there is a solution. These were used as paraphernalia to try to sell people on the idea of contributing money to us. In the meantime, they set up a foundation. So that if anybody, just any old body, wanted to part with a few bucks and give it to us, they would have a foundation established so it would be tax deductible. And the first five trustees were established, uh, three, non, three non-alcoholic and two alcoholics. And one of the alcoholics, short time, got drunk and they'd made provision for that. If you're drunk and, uh, and you're a trustee, you're off bingo, automatic. And uh, they used to have these meetings uh, monthly to talk about what was happening and nothing was happening. And about this time, a fellow by the name of Hank Parkhurst jumped into the scene. He was a protege of Dr. Silkworth, got sober about 1936, and uh, was uh, was a, an ex-executive, oil company executive. And Bill described him as having red hair, energy beyond telling, and an idea a minute. Now, I like that kind of guy. I like I like to have one of those in every one of the groups I've ever been in. And uh, and Henry was just full of it. And he said to Bill, he says, Bill, that foundation ain't done nothing for you and they're not going to. He says, what we got to do is put this book on a business-like basis and we'll make it work. What we got to do is form a corporation and sell stock in this book. And Bill says, you know, I've had some thoughts about that. But mine aren't as big as yours. <laughs> But anyway, uh, uh, Bill says, well, we don't have any money to form a corporation. Besides, uh, we, you know, it takes money to do that. So the next day, uh, thank you, Hank comes back in, and he's gone to the bookstore and bought a pad of blank stock certificates. Across the top, he writes, Works Publishing Incorporated, because he thought this was the first of many works. And at the bottom, he signed Henry Parkhurst, President. And uh, and he says, well, Bill, what other small details do you want to take care of? <laughs> Then they went around trying to sell them stock certificates to people, to the AAs or the, the, the sober members of the New York contingent and anybody else that would be willing to buy a stock certificate. They weren't just going to hold it for us. And lo and behold, Henry would go around and browbeat and just shake the trees and, and, and stand in the face of these people saying they ought to buy this book if they're going to sell, it's going to make a millions of dollars. As a matter of fact, he came up with prospectuses showing how much money was to be made. They found out it would take about 10% of the book cost to, to publish it, and, and he was figuring, uh, you know, if it had three and a half, three fifty, we sold this thing for, it cost 35 cents. We wouldn't have all those other fees that other authors have. He said, it's just going to roll in. And uh, But they couldn't sell a stock certificate. <laughs> and them alcoholics were saying, you've got some nerve coming here trying to sell me stock in a book you haven't even written yet. I mean, what? give me a break. And so... Henry was sure this book was a good deal. And he says, you know what we got to do? I don't know where Henry got these great ideas, but this was a great idea. He says, we'll go up and talk to Reader's Digest. And maybe they'll print an article about the book and about what we're doing. Let's go see them. And they went up to uh, New York, Pleasanton, New York, and saw the editor, Payne. And, uh, and they explained what they were doing, and they were about to come out with a book, and so on and so forth. And Payne says, well, that sounds rather interesting. Rockefeller, spirituality, and all that stuff, Nick, that sounds like something we might want to do an article on. But he says, I'll have to check it up with my managers. Come back later, and, uh, and, and uh, when your book is finished, we'll put some authors on it. 
But of course, I got to check it up with my managers. Of course, they didn't hear that. They were out the door already, headed back to New York with the good news. Well, when these drunks found out that Reader's Digest was going to do an article on them, I mean, this is what Bill and Henry told them. When they found out that Reader's Digest was going to do an article, well, hey, guess what? They began to sell them stock certificates. I mean, the possibility of getting a return on a $25 investment, and you mean I can put $5 down, pay it off monthly? Wonderful. Let me have a couple. <laughs> and and they, they had it set up in, uh, in uh, 600 chairs. Two for Bill, two for Henry, and 200 to sell. And uh, it's either three, three, and three, or two, two, and two, I'm not really sure, but... <laughs> But uh, they sold off a third of the shares. Bill and Bob, uh, Bill and Henry kept the rest of it. Well, they began to accumulate money, and it was during this time that the book was being written. Bill was working from some rough draft copies, and uh, the the arguing that went on. Bill would draft, he would do some writing on the par based on a title heading of a paragraph, and and Ruth Hawk was our wonderful secretary that had been hired to do something else, but wound up typing this book. Uh, uh, they would send it out to Dr. Bob. He would approve it. He loved what was being written. But in New York, lo and behold, they argued, they fought. Nothing. It was just, it was horrendous. Can you imagine, can you imagine us two or three years sober trying to write this book? Can you imagine? <laughs> I can't either. But they argued and fought about what was going into the book. And, uh, and, uh, and there was many a time that Bill thought about throwing the book out the window. As a matter of fact, uh, in December of 1937, December 1938, he had reached the fifth chapter of the book. He said he'd done enough window dressing. It was time to put the backbone of this book right there in the fifth chapter. That was the way he described it. And Bill knew that he wasn't an author. He knew of the trouble he'd had up until that time about getting approval or getting a consensus of those folks who were who were debating the chapters that he had already written. He describes it in A.A. Comes of Age as being uh, one of those nights that he knew he had to do it. He got in bed. He said he wrote best in bed. Uh, he was tired through and through. I put pad and pencil on his knee and he asked for guidance. And I think that's the key. He asked for guidance. And he began to reflect on what had occurred since Abby had come to see him. He reflected on those six tenants that Abby had given him. And uh, he reflected on how successful they had been with that. And he reflected on the idea that alcoholics were cunning, baffling, and powerful. And now that uh, he needed to perhaps break those six steps down into smaller pieces so that the alcoholic couldn't rationalize his way out of it and jump through the hoop. And so after praying for guidance, he began to write. And he wrote for about 30 minutes. And then he reviewed what he had written. And what he had written was the first part of chapter 5, how it works. He added up those steps, and, uh, and it seemed that they added up to 12. And somehow or another, that seemed appropriate. He thought about the 12 apostles. And about that time, a couple of alcoholics came in, Henry and a pigeon. And uh, Henry and a pigeon probably been to a meeting. And uh, they'd probably been to a meeting like they'd always been, like you and I go to a meeting. We go to a meeting, and we're sitting there talking about 12 steps. And we go over and see a co-founder, and he all of a sudden tells us we got 24. We're going to be mad about that. <laughs> You didn't ask me. <laughs> so Henry comes in and Bill reads them 12 steps that he's so proud of. And Henry says, whoa, what are you doing? He says, you've got too much God in these steps. He said, these alcoholics going to buy that. He said, what do you mean asking an alcoholic to get down on his knees? No way. It won't work. And Bill sat and defended every word he had written. But Henry and he started arguing about it. And, it, and, and so it went until Lois finally came in and says, you guys hush and have a cup of coffee. And then Henry began to see some of the value of what Bill had written. But uh, uh, it was about this time that they had had a meeting also with, uh, which, with respect uh, to the uh, atheist in our, amongst us at that time. Hank Parkhurst was an agnostic atheist. Jimmy Burwell was an atheist. And they didn't want the book to be written with any God in it at all. We had three factions which influenced our book. We had that bunch that were the atheists and agnostics who didn't want a God mentioned at all in that book. And then we had the other end of it who were the uh, absolute uh, 
uh, the other side of it, who wanted it to be absolutely written in biblical terms. They wanted the Bible mentioned. They wanted the these and the thous and so on and so forth in there. That was Fitz Mayo from Maryland. He was a preacher's son. And then we had the other majority, the 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 uh, liberals, who who did not want to take either side, but they said we need to write a book that's spiritual in nature, not theological in nature. And so these were the three factions that influenced the book, and they all took turns. Uh, at, at putting an input. And one of the things that the atheists did for us was in the fifth chapter, they compromised the wording. Mm -hmm. they, they said that the set steps should be uh, suggested instead of uh, directions. And the other is that they said that, that we need to describe God as you understand him. And uh, so this was the compromise we made and such was the uh, contribution for the, from the atheists. And I don't know how many thousands and thousands of alcoholics that allowed to come to AA uh, and how many it might have kept out, but but it was their contribution. And as a matter of fact, it was at this stage of the game that Bill Wilson finally got permission from them all to let him be the final judge as to what was going to go into the, to the book. Now, he gave in on that fifth chapter, the first couple of pages, but as soon as that was over and he got their permission, he put directions right back in there. Absolutely, and we're going to see how he did that. But uh, he, he, was able, he was able to compromise because he said, listen, if you don't, you don't let me have some authority on this book. He said, I ain't writing it. And of course, the rest of them said, well, are you going to write it? Are you going to write it? I can't write it. I'm not going to write it. Let's let Bill write it. And so, thank God they did that. And so he began to uh, finish the book and uh, describe the steps from step three on. And then they decided, well, we need some testimony. See, they didn't have meetings all over the world at that time. They didn't have nothing. And so we need some testimony from recovering alcoholics describing how they had their spiritual awakening. And spiritual experience. And so they went to Akron and picked up a few stories and they got some from New York. The Akron stories were edited by a uh, recovered uh, editor or a newspaper man. And the stories in uh, New York were edited by uh, Hank Parkhurst and Bill, much to the chagrin of the New York storytellers. They didn't like these guys <laughs> editing their stories. And uh, so finally they had about 36 stories, I think, in this edition. Uh, and ultimately they... Uh, uh, found a publisher, Cornwall Press, that uh, that agreed, Mr. Eugene Exman, agreed to print the book for us. And we got close to the publication. And I'm cutting out a lot of this. I want to tell you the story of this big book is in AA Comes of Age from about page 140 to 182. Uh, they uh, uh, get close to getting the thing published, and uh, then they think, well, gee, we got to go back to Reader's Digest. Let them know this thing's about ready so that they can put an, an editor on it, you know, and get this, this article done. So they go back to Pleasanton, New York to talk to Mr. Payne, and they go in and say, we're ready to go, we're ready to shoot. I think that was Hank's term, and the guy says, shoot what? <laughs> and then they brought him up to date, and he says, oh, you're those guys from that, uh, that are, they're having some luck sobering up drunks. He says, well, you know, I told you that I had to check up with the editors, and the other editors thought it was just too controversial, didn't want to do anything with it. And I forgot to let you know. Oh. <laughs> well, Hank and Bill were just dejected. Oh, I mean, I can just, I almost can feel that for them now. Just like the wind is out of the sail and somebody's popped the balloon, it's over. And on the way back to New York, they were thinking, oh, these guys are really going to get us now. You know, it's going to be, oh, we told you so. <laughs> but you know, when they got back, they didn't find any of that. The guys were saying, hey, where's your faith? This thing's going to work out. It's okay. And uh, we'll get publicity some other way. Well, they had a tough time getting published. As a matter of fact, the book finally came off the press. Uh, they only was able to put up $500 to get it done. The books were in the bonded warehouse. Uh, they couldn't get any favorable publicity anywhere. And one thing they had was this guy by the name of Morgan. Morgan came up one day with a nice idea. He said, you know, I used to be in the radio ad business, and I know Gabriel Heater. And Gabriel Heater had a radio talk show, nationally syndicated, called We the People. He says, maybe I'll go down and talk to Gabriel. And he went down to call, talk to Gabriel Heater, came back and said, guess what? Gabriel Heater's going to do an art. He's going to, I'm going to be on his show in about 10 days, and he's going to let me do a pitch about my own recovery, and we're going to mention the book, A Sure Cure for Alcoholism. And then Hank was revitalized. He got some new ideas. He says, what we need to do is to send a postcard to all the physicians east of the Mississippi telling them to listen to this show and order this book, A Sure Cure for Alcoholism. 
but they didn't have the money to do that. So they got an IOU or took out a note uh, and got uh, $400 or so or $1,000, five or $600, whatever it took. He got the postcards printed and sent it out to all the positions east of the Mississippi. In the meantime, they remembered that Morgan was a recent released insane asylum inmate. <laughs> Based on results, it was a good possibility he wouldn't make the 10 days. <laughs> so, what are we going to do? We're going to lock him up. <laughs> they found the guy who had a membership in the downtown athletic club, and they persuaded Morgan to be locked up. They put him in this room and put a guard on that door around the clock. And they would not let him out of their sight. And lo and behold, the time came and Morgan appeared sober and done an excellent job. The manuscript of that story is, or that interview is in Pass It On. He done a nice job for us. And, uh, and so then, uh, after that was over, Henry and Bill and Ruth wait 72 hours to go down to the post office to pick up all the postcard orders. And then three days later, they all go down, like they described, they each had a suitcase in hand. <laughs> they go down to the post office. And you know them old little windows they used to have and looked in there and they didn't see much. But old Henry says, don't worry, they probably got them in the bags in the back. So they called the mail clerk out and said, we're here to get our postcards. And the guy opened it and said, that's it. Another $500 shot. Ten or eleven were replies in one order. And such as it was, we could not publicize this book. We could not get anybody. As good as it is and as good as it always has been, we just could not get any publicity. Uh, Emerson Fosdick did a nice review. Catholic people in New York City did a nice review. And ultimately, the Liberty uh, Magazine did a, a review, Alcoholics and God. We began to get some responses. As a matter of fact, there were about 800 responses from that article. And uh, some books were beginning to sell. And some correspondence was beginning to be chalked up with other people across the country. And they began to send out personal notes to anybody that ordered a book. And they even started sending out the serenity prayer, which they discovered uh, out of an obituary. And then uh, then in uh, the March of 1941, uh, uh, the... Uh, Saturday Evening Post article came out with Jack Alexander, and uh, starting in the 1940, uh, 41, we had 2,000 members, and at the end of 1941, basically as a result of that article, we had 8,000 members, a 400% increase. Al Alcoholics Anonymous was really on the move at that time, and, uh, and, and, and as they began to move, things began to happen. You see, I told you about the Washingtonian movement, that it, they had a 1,000 people at the end of one year. We were struggling to get 40 together, exaggerated, in 1937, two and a half years after we came together. Well, then when this book began to move out and, and little cells of alcoholics began to be formed in the early 1940s, we found out something. We found out we could get sober following the instructions in this book. This is one of those original 5,000 books right here. This is my book. And this is one of the original 5,000 that, uh, that were being sent here and there across the country. And they were following the instructions in the chapter, working with others about how to start up groups. And they found out they could get sober. But what, guess what else they found out? They weren't so sure they could live together. They weren't so sure they could even get along. And then and New York took the tact in the beginning that they weren't giving instructions to anybody. They'd write back and say, well, listen. In Abilene, Texas, another group similar to yours had the same problem. This is what they did. Maybe you can try to do this, and please let us know what happens. And he gets this, well, that's not what I want. I want some punishment here. I want somebody to tell somebody something. <laughs> and it wasn't happening that way. And this correspondence kept going and going, and, and, and ultimately, Bill and some of those folks up there could see some common denominators with respect to the problems that we were having living together with respect to membership, with respect to professionalism, with respect to autonomy, with respect to public relations, with respect to all sorts of things, primary purpose and outside issues. And so a, in the, in the mid-1940s, Bill began to formulate, with the, with, with the, by the suggestion of another member, some guidelines to hold us together. And so Bill, uh, in the 1945 time, uh, 
the great bomb was started, and he started writing about the ten, the twelve points of survival for Alcoholics Anonymous, and he began to publish them. Well, as we began to read about those things, and Bill has started to promote the traditions, and from 1945 to 1950, people were just didn't want to hear about it. They'd invite Bill out to speak and say, Bill, come on down here and talk to us and tell us about how you hid the bottle in the, in the water uh, casket. Or, but uh, please don't mention them damn traditions. They don't want to hear about it. But in 1950, we finally got together and uh, uh, the first international convention in Cleveland, Ohio, and accepted the 12 traditions. And you know, we are the, dec we are the descendants or we are the uh, benefactors of those who preceded us. And uh, I never like to lose sight of that. That uh, I have grandchildren myself today that may one day need this program. So it's our responsibility to see to it that we keep it intact. We owe this to them because we had it for us, didn't we? I don't think there's anybody in here when we started in 1935. So we are all, maybe Tim, but... <laughs> But we all are the benefactors of those who loved us enough to say that it matters to me that we hold this thing together. Thank you.